Well, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you very much for joining us on our August monthly software webcast. My name is Chris Dubuque. I'm a field technical services manager located in the far northwest of the country out in, in Portland, Oregon. And I'm just going to be helping out the presenters with today's webcast. I would like to introduce today's presenters. We've got Kurt Curtin. He's our technical manager for the simulation and electrical products. And Brian Cook, a SOLIDWORKS electrical and PCB specialist. Uh, they've worked together to create a very, very informative, very interesting presentation. Uh, so with that said, gentlemen, I'll go ahead and hand the presentation over to you guys. All right. Thanks, Chris. Brian and I are excited to present this material to you today, guys, and hope that you'll find it helpful and consider these two great products to, to meet your product design needs. Here's where we're headed with the agenda. I'll show you the electronics assembly we'll be working with and introduce flow simulation to you. In the process, I'll show a, a couple of items related to the setup of a baseline thermal analysis within our flow simulation tool. Brian's going to then um, show the PCB product and demonstrate how it's going to be easy to collaborate between mechanical and electrical design teams. And finally, I'll go back into flow simulation and leverage the previous setup information to get a quick new analysis set up and run for the modified assembly to see what impact our new sub-assembly has on the design. We should be able to wrap things up within about 35 minutes or so. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. So here's our original design. The original design consists of an, an electrical enclosure with your typical electronic components. CPU and memory chips, power supplies, resistors, capacitors, and heat sinks with uh, openings in the enclosure to allow the free flow of air forced by the inlet fans to cool everything off. So that's uh, sort of our original setup there. And then our modified design is going to um, have an additional PCB subassembly, a daughter board, and that contains more electronic components. Uh, and it's located in the corner there, as you see. And here's the side-by-side -side comparison of the two. So let's go ahead and um, jump into the section related to flow simulation of this uh, baseline thermal analysis. So what we're after is the maintaining a maximum, uh, a maximum allowed temperature of 50 degrees C on the chips that you see highlighted there within the, this assembly. So uh, that's, that's our goal for our thermal analysis. We want to make sure we don't exceed that temperature on those chips. That's, that's a requirement for the vendors. Before I jump into the program, I want to give you a brief overview of what flow simulation is for those that may not be familiar. So it's our full CFD solution that, that uh, gives you the ability to analyze fluid flow and heat transfer in, in real-world hardware. Um, so you see there a, an image of a valve with flow through it. That's one example of an internal flow. We can do internal, internal flows such as what you see there. We can also do external flows uh, with, where you have fluid surrounding the device or say an airplane wing or whatever. So as far as the capabilities of flow simulation, we can do, like I said, internal or external flows or a combination. We can do laminar or turbulent or transitional flows. We have a rotating mesh capability. Uh, the program can handle incompressible and compressible fluids, Newtonian and non-Newtonian liquids, and finally heat transfer simulations. And that's really going to be the focus today is we're going to be looking at the heat transfer within that enclosure. So I'm going to jump into SOLIDWORKS now and I'll show you that that uh, model and the setup. So if you're familiar with SOLIDWORKS configurations, we have several set up within this assembly. And the flow simulation tool can leverage those very, very well. We can do several what-if scenarios. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to um, the first analysis configuration here that shows us the the, uh, a little bit of a simplification to it, and it's going to give us the ability to, to step through the uh, solved project here. 
Before I do that, what I want to do is show you how one a project like this would be created. The tool has a very powerful wizard interface that uh, that can be used to do so. And I like to tell people, you know, when I teach this class, that you know the the wizard type of a concept is kind of a one of those that is really just uh, for beginners. And you really once you once you really know how to use the program, you use leave the wizard behind. But for this case, it's it's the exception. Uh, as you'll see as I step through it. So we pick our unit system, and we can further customize any of those uh, parameters within that system. So for instance, I want to look at my temperature in Celsius. So I can, I can quickly uh, change that one parameter and stick with the rest in SI. An internal or external flow problem. Uh, I'm going to have my heat conduction and solids turned on here. Um, any, any of the other items that I might want to do, say I want to do, just do a straight heat transfer problem, no flow, I can turn that on as well. Here's some of the other things. We have that rotation capability for rotating regions. We can do transient analyses. If my flow is going to be a, sort of a free-flowing, uh, gravity-induced natural convection, I can turn on gravity. So all of those controls right there at my, my fingertips. I've got a full library of materials to choose from. Uh, quickly add those. If I want to go out and generate one, I've got access to the engineering database right here. Here's my predefined list. I can quickly use my, my typical Windows applications to add new, new items to a user-defined list and, and so on. So great access within the program to that database. I have heat transfer turned on so I can pick a default solid that's involved. Uh, I'll just grab one out of here and proceed. We'll, I'll show you the solve setup. Um, and then our, some, some wall conditions for the program, as well as initial conditions. And at this point, I'm pretty much done, ready to set up that project. If I need to go back to any of those other areas, for instance, if I use the wrong fluid, I can navigate right through here within the wizard. So a very powerful tool to quickly set up uh, your initial your initial analysis project. I've got a computational domain that's highlighted there with the, the borders and the black borders. And then I simply step through either with right clicks for the uh, within the tree to do boundary conditions, heat sources, and et cetera. I can do that just right there with the, my right click mouse. If you prefer to drive the program with the command manager, there's a full uh, set of tools there within the flow sim uh, command manager. And I can also turn on the, the toolbars if you're a toolbar user. So really great uh, access to all the functions. So what I, what I want to do for the sake of time is just go in back and activate this existing project that was set up for that initial design. So just kind of stepping through a few of these things, I uh, have a variety of materials applied to the, to the other components here. Um, looking down through the list here, I've got some openings that I apply my environmental pressure to. So these are allowing the pressure to either enter or exit, depending on the flow conditions. The fans are going to drive the flow. These are straight from the, the engineering database. Accessible once again when I'm setting them up, picking a face of the, the where the fan exit is. Accessible. Uh, the, the library is very accessible right here within the, the, uh, the list. I can go back into the engineering database and create more if I need to. So real quick and easy setup with some predefined fan curves. I've got those. So it's kind of stepping through the list here. We've got some heat sources. I'm just going to display, display all of these. You'll see I've got some, some uh, heat power applied to those chips. I've got some fixed temperatures on these capacitors and so on. So lots of uh, ways to apply power, uh, either through surface sources, volume sources, et cetera. So going down the list, there's some custom um, items that come into play if you further enhance the, the flow simulation tool with what's called the electronics cooling module. Not an absolutely necessary item to run these types of problems, but one that enhances it in a couple of ways. Here's one of those ways that it does so. It has some two-resistor virtual components. So I can go get the information from the library of components and apply those right away. You'll see this is a 15-watt source power source on this, uh, this CPU here. 
those types of things are right there at my fingertips with the additional uh, functionality that comes into play with the electronics cooling module add-in. Uh, for, for those uh, openings that you saw in the original screenshot uh, of the design, we had some perforated holes here. We had some slots up here on these openings. We're going to leverage the virtual representation of those to, uh, to do that, that in a more efficient way. So instead of explicitly meshing that throughout those, uh, those small openings, we've got a uh, circular hole perforated plate functionality that does a very good job of, of doing that and simplifying the overhead. Looking through the list here, remember we talked about those chips needing to be at a, below a certain temperature. So I've got goals for all of those, as you see here. Uh, all of those temperatures, uh, I selected too many there. If I go here, that's the, the ones of interest. And to set these up, you know, remember we've got the full functionality and the link with the SOLIDWORKS tool. So I've got a selection set in here. Uh, great interaction with the, the, the two functionalities, the CAD and the simulation world. So goals will allow us to monitor those, thing, monitor those things along the way. So having set that up with the flow conditions and those temperatures, I can go ahead and look at some of the results that are set up here. I've got a uh, couple of cut plots that have been defined, and you'll see how this displays very clearly the temperatures throughout the model. I can quickly hide the geometry and just look straight away at the, the temperature information without the geometry actually getting in the way. So as I drag this through the uh, computational domain, you'll see those temperatures update. So getting it to an area where I've got the, the CPU and the chips would be in this area, you can see the CPU temperature right there. I can probe these very quickly and see what those values are on the fly. Drop a probe if I'd like to as well. So this allows us to quickly get to the area of interest and see where we are with our, with our temperatures. Lots of other functionality for uh, displaying results. Let me turn the geometry back on. I'll hide that plot and show the um, the flow trajectories, very powerful visualization in a three-dimensional sense for how the flow progresses. I'm going to edit this and make it a little bit more visible. I have a variety of ways to show it. You'll see I've got some arrows here. I can show this with uh, spheres is a good one to, to show and animate. So with the uh, spheres turned on and an animation of that, which I, should, I believe should show OK, you can visualize where that flow is going and how it recirculates and how it moves around through the enclosure. All right, so having done those types of setups and solutions, let's get to the heart of the matter. We're really interested in those uh, chips, chip temperatures. So I'm going to go into a surface plot here. I'll show that surface plot, and we have a color-coded version of what that looks like on those on those individual chips. I'll just hide this, uh, delete that uh, probe there. So you can see we've got uh, surface temperatures everywhere, and if I turn on my probe tool again, I can pick those surfaces and I get an immediate readout of what those are. So very powerful post-processing with this program. It's really probably my favorite of all the simulation tools. We can really get uh, some good information out of it. So with that, uh, we see that we're in an acceptable range with the, with the existing design. Wanted to show you some screenshots of how we got there with that solution. So you see here uh, a solver monitor window that is available to us as the solution is progressing. This one took uh, about 30, 30 or 40 minutes to solve. You see we have information about the size of the problem. We've got uh, estimated times here or solving it so we can get an idea of what's going on as it's progressing. Our goals, I mentioned those goals uh, for those chips and others were set up and we can see that it's converging on those and this is in the process of the solution. We've got the, the color plot, that section plot that I showed you, showed you. we have the avail that available to us within the solver monitor window as well. So really uh, a good way to keep track of things and if things are not looking like we expected them, 
if I'm seeing flow going the wrong way or temperatures are getting really, really hot in an area I didn't expect, I've got full control of the, of the simulation here. I can stop it. I don't have to wait till everything's done before I get an idea of what's going on. Stop it, go change the setup, and off I go. All right, so at this point, I want to turn it over to Mr. Brian Cook and uh, let him go through his part related to the PCB design and collaboration. Yes, thanks, Kurt. Um, yeah, I'll be going over the SOLIDWORKS PCB product that we have uh, and how I was able to create that daughter board and collaborate with SOLIDWORKS so that we know that it fits in there and we don't have any sort of collisions going on. So just to talk a little bit of an introduction to what SOLIDWORKS PCB is, um, it came out two years ago, but it was in partnership with Altium. So it's got 25 years of Altium's technology behind it, as well as SOLIDWORKS. So this is an end-to-end -end solution where we have the schematic capture tool that is tied to real-time component supply chain information. So that way you know whether your parts are going to be in stock with the supplier that you like and what their current cost is. Also, it is integrated with a PCB layout tool. So if you're using separate programs for that now, maybe you have to export and import a netlist in order to go from schematic to layout. That's a big plus with this tool where it's all integrated in one client. Uh, this uh, layout tool also has intelligent interactive routing with design rule checking built in. You can even visualize your board in 3D without ever leaving the software. Uh, without having to go over to SOLIDWORKS, you can make sure that you don't have any sort of collisions uh, between your uh, different components on the board. But the big collaboration feature that we feel differentiates our product is that uh, collaboration with SOLIDWORKS. All right, so we do have the ability to collaborate with SOLIDWORKS with the native uh, data exchange, it's always in sync, um, so you don't have to import and export the step files for every change. This does also integrate with SOLIDWORKS Electrical, um, but also as well as the rest of the SOLIDWORKS ecosystem. So well, like what we're seeing today, we're going to be able to get the board in our assembly, wire it up, uh, run some heat simulations, and then uh, what we won't show, though, in this case, is running it through Visualize, you can get a nice rendered picture such as this. So everything in the SOLIDWORKS ecosystem is a really nice feature. So let's start with uh, showing uh, some of the schematic creation and how I started off with the um, using SOLIDWORKS CCV to generate this board. So the schematic capture tool in here, one of the features I said that we have is the real-time component supplier links. So you're able to search for that part number Right within the software, I can see all these different suppliers, what they have available. For example, here at Newark, I can see they've got a little less than 200 of those parts available for around $2. DigiKey has a few more uh, components available, about 2,000, so maybe I want to pick them as a supplier. If I double-click on uh, documents here, it will take me to the PDF data sheet uh, just linked through their website. And again, this is not like a local database that's having to be kept up to date. It's searching their website. So if I attach it to the component, it will put that information in my bill of materials. And that can be linked at the library level as well, so you don't have to actually search every time you place a symbol. And of course, we have the rest of the standard tools that you would expect inside of a schematic uh, capture program, being able to insert symbols and place wires uh, where it will automatically uh, assign net names. So if I connect pin 10 here out to the circuit for my, uh, that, that I've got a net name of Piezo. It will make those connections. If you don't apply a net name, it does its own. You can apply your own uh, custom net name if you want. It's not super important other than visual information, though, because like I said, it does um, uh, link to the 2D layout here inside of the software. So if I want to place another symbol, I'll just search the library that I've built up. These libraries are easy to build. We've got wizards that help you make your schematic and footprint symbols. So we place the component. Most of our components, you know, you place it, it doesn't get a number until the end. When you're all done, you'll annotate it so that everything gets numbered in a way that's easy to read uh, and find your components on your page. So we'll just push everything that I've done to the board layout so I can do some of the uh, footprint placement. 
So in this case, all I did was add a resistor. So there's one footprint for me to place. And you can see the rat's nest lines showing net connections that need to be made there. I could start routing, but I want to go ahead and make sure we get the mechanical stuff done first. So I'm going to place components where I think they need to be. And I'm not going to mess with the outline just yet. I'm going to push this over to a central server uh, that is going to handle the collaboration with SolidWorks. So I'll put in some text so, I, so that Kurt would know what kind of state it's at. I've put in the board outline and the initial components. Um, and now we can go over to SolidWorks and allow it to generate a 3D assembly from this information. So we'll switch over to SolidWorks. You can see here the, that assembly that Kurt was working on. And on the right in the PCB add-in, I just click on pull board from Vault, select the project that we're working on, and it's going to communicate with that central server, finding out the current state. Since this is an initial assembly, I have to tell it where to save it, and that can be saved anywhere. Um, now it's going to find out what the board size is and thickness, what components are there. There's three components that are linked inside the 2D footprints in the software. So it can place those 3D parts, and we end up with an assembly. So let's go back to our top-level assembly and place it. Just place it anywhere, and then we can start using the standard SOLIDWORKS tools to mate it in place and start editing this board outline in context. Now you can see here it's going kind of fast. This was a recording, and I'm really not the best uh, SOLIDWORKS user, so I had to for the sake of time, speed this up. But what I'm doing is just changing the outline, making sure the board can fit around all the components, those resistors. I don't really want them in between the boards, so I'll flip it around. You can see how much I struggle with this. But eventually, I will have all of the boards, uh, the board enclosed within the enclosure with the components where they need to be. And then I'll just push that back to the central server, saying that we changed the outline and move the resistors. So if I go back over to SOLIDWORKS, you'll see I got a notification that a change was detected. I can preview those changes. How did the board outline change? How did the resistors move? And I can accept any or all of the changes and then apply it. And I know that everything is in sync with what was defined on the mechanical side. I know this board is going to fit. I know there's no uh, collisions with the mechanical components. And I can start now doing my route. It also works two-directional. So if I move something again here and push it back, it would update the component location on the SOLIDWORKS side when uh, Kurt gets a notification that a change was detected. So you can see how easily that made it so we were able to generate this SOLIDWORKS assembly uh, and place that and edit it in context. So. You may be familiar with CircuitWorks, which is what uh, has been our ECB tool in the past, and it still exists, but this is really CircuitWorks on steroids because it allows that two-directional communication uh, and it maintains a link, so you're not having to import and export a new step file every time you make a design change and having to redefine uh, mates to get everything uh, where it's supposed to be within the assembly. So at this point, now that we've got that daughter board, we can transfer this back to Kurt, and he can make sure that the, uh, the flow, that didn't mess up anything with our heat. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Brian. So yeah, we're, we'll check in with uh, SOLIDWORKS now, and we'll take a look at this uh, analysis related to that modified assembly. So here we are, here where we left it, left off with that existing uh, design. I can leverage this, like I said, I can work into um, getting in that new new design analyzed by cloning what I have already. So I'll go into that mode and notice that um, I can go to different configuration, even though that was set up with the um, with that original configuration. I've got this uh, one here with the, the new subassembly that I can clone it straight to that. So quick and easy, that information gets transferred over. I've got my new project to work with. I have to clean up a couple of things related to the uh, the application of things, and uh, and I'm ready and ready to to make those edits. You'll see I've got some information here that needs to be updated. 
the flow program warns me about things that have changed. So what I'm going to do is uh, instead of working on that one, I'll just jump into the one that is already solved. Let's activate that one. And let's see what that looks like. You'll see I had to add the, the power to the new items here within the heat sources. And I believe that was it, uh, other than remeshing and solving this project. It was pretty much ready to go as it came over from the cloned version. Uh, I have my uh, chip surface temperatures here that I can show. Let me load up these results into the database, into the, the memory, and load those up and show it. So those are kind of obscured by that new geometry there, but you can see a change uh, that has been uh, occurred as a result of that new airflow. Um, the, the flow coming in from those fans is going to be sort of redirected in some ways by that new hardware that's in there. You can see the, the heat sink that was added in there uh, to dissipate some of the heat from these new items as well. So with that, uh, with that new information, the, the resolved project, uh, we're ready to look at our comparison of results. Uh, the goal plots are, are great for that. I can go into um, a goal, edit my goal plot here, and you see I have the, the main chip and the, the 10 RAM chips highlighted here. And I can show the information related to this solution. So notice I've got a quick export to Excel as well. I'll show you that in just a second. But what this does is it gives me the basic information that I'm looking for. I've got the goals for all those, those all of those volumes. I've got uh, averaged values of temperatures throughout the solution. I've got maximum values, as you see here. I can look at the summary information like that, or I can look at the history of how those converge. So this is that convergence plot that you saw in that solver window. And you can see I had a little bit of oscillatory behavior here in some of these, so I might want to investigate uh, if that's a very prevalent thing, whether or not I need to do a transient solution. I get that information from that. So let's sh show that uh, connection, the direct connection to Excel. I have Excel open here. I'm just going to uh, close this out. Let me save it out first. Just show you the, uh, the, the way that that is uh, super powerful. <clears throat> I'll replace that one on the desktop. And let's close that out. So Excel is closed. I'm going to ex export this information out to Excel. And you can see how quickly it'll do that. It takes all of that data from, those, uh, from that information that was uh, calculated for those chips. And here's that table that we were looking at. Just, just but prior to this in the uh, interface itself, here is my uh, plot that you saw. And then here's the actual raw data for further processing. So I've got all of that information right here out to Excel if I need to do some post-processing. So I did that uh, for, the, um, for the two designs. I used this goal plot information to go and generate an Excel file that I combine, then combined and I put that into the, um, the presentation here. So here's our, uh, the, the end of our analysis with uh, the extra board in there. And I put that into a table here, that information about those, those goals that you saw from the Excel. So side by side, original and modified temperatures. And you see the hot spots here. For the original, my hot spot was at 45 degrees on the main ship. And then for the modified design, I've got um, about 45 and a half degrees in this, in this chip here, chip number nine, that RAM chip. And so you can see how, in some of the cases, the uh, modification actually dropped the temperature a little bit due to that, that redirection in the, in the airflow. And in some cases, it increased it slightly. But all in all, this checks out. We're, we're still below our, our 50 degrees C limit on those chips. And so we could say we're good to go. So that brings us to the end. So what we've showed you is that uh, with flow simulation, we can do advanced thermal analyses of electronics enclosures like we saw here with a lot of other capabilities in terms of internal and external flow problems. We showed you how we can do the collaboration between the mechanical and electrical design teams and how smoothly that 
works and and is they be able to bring that back into flow and and check things, make sure things are as they need to be. We've not exceeded our limits. So all in all, SolidWorks, the suite of SolidWorks products will allow you to do great unified electronics design. And that brings us to the end. I think we're right about 35 minutes, Chris. So I think uh, I look like I nailed that time pretty good. Fantastic. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I really do appreciate that. And before, before we wrap things up, I just want to mention our upcoming webinars that we have. So we have a number of webinars that will be available throughout the rest of August. Um, on August 21st, we've got a DriveWorks Design Automation webcast. We've got our great catapult sessions on August 23rd, going deeper into simulation and flow, really looking kind of like this example, the, the two pieces of software working together. And then we'll wrap up our August webcasts with a uh, scanning, scan the 3D and printing that, how to leverage those color scans. So again, thank you everyone for joining. If you have any questions, you know, go ahead and send them in on the chat. And if not, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you very much.